it's uh, 9.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, before I introduce our veto speaker for the day, uh, I want to make a couple of announcements. Um, in the Bates room at 11 after the talk, uh, there will be a colloquium for our College of Criminal Justice graduate students. And uh, at noon, over in the C Java Cafe, uh, will be a lunch, so please feel free to stop by for that. Um, as you know, the Vito Lecture Series has been going on for over 30 years, and we've had a long list of very distinguished scholars come and present to us over the years, and today we're pleased to add to that list uh, Dr. James Forrest. He is a professor at University of Massachusetts Lowell and director of the Security Studies program there. He's also a senior fellow with the Joint Operations University where he conducts research on emerging terrorist threats, insurgencies, transnational criminal networks, and U.S. Special Forces training. Uh, prior to going to UMass Lowell, he was the Director of Terrorism Studies at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he taught courses there on the international relations, terrorism, counterterrorism, information warfare, comparative politics, and sub-Saharan Africa. And he also received several civilian uh, army uh, awards during his tenure there. He was also recently selected by the Center for American Progress and Foreign Policy as one of America's most esteemed terrorism and national security experts. He is the author of over 19 books and dozens of articles on the topic, um, including in journals such as Terrorism and Political Violence, Crime and Delinquency, and Perspectives on Terrorism. Uh, he holds uh, graduate degrees from Stanford, Stanford University and Boston College and undergraduate degrees from Georgetown University and De Anza College. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Forrest. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, first off, just let me say it's a, it's a privilege, privilege and an honor to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. And I um, uh, appreciate the hospitality I've had here in Texas. Uh, every time I come to Texas, it's, the hospitality is always uh, incredible, and the food is always incredible as well. Um, I'm going to launch into a very complicated topic today. We're talking about the threat of terrorists using weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so because I'm an academic, I'm going to give you the illusion of my thoughts being organized on such a complex uh, topic. I've prepared some PowerPoint slides for you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about terrorists and terrorism to sort of set the stage of the actors, the people, the dudes and dudettes who would want to use these weapons. Then we'll shift gears and talk about the weapons themselves and then we'll put them together to talk about the framework of which we analyze that kind of very unique, complex kind of threat. Uh, to begin with, defining terrorism. There is a perception of terrorists as these wild-haired, wide-eyed, crazy dudes just blowing stuff up. And if you buy into that perception of terrorists, then everything else I'm going to say for the next 90 minutes is going to make no sense whatsoever. Because when we really analyze terrorists and terrorism, we find, first and foremost, uh, there's strategy, strategic objectives. Um, there's a number of things that parallel with criminal organization networks in terms of the challenges they face, as well as the way in which they structure themselves. Um, what they try to achieve includes coercing others through the use of fear, uh, violence, or the threat of violence. Um, there's a lot of operational security challenges that terrorist networks face, as well as organized criminal networks face. There's financial challenges they face, but these are rational human beings. Terrorism is, this is going to sound a little weird, but terrorism is a human endeavor in the sense that no other species on the planet engages in terrorist activity. Koala bears don't terrorize other koala bears. Dolphins don't terrorize other dolphins. It's a human endeavor. And so if you take that perspective, you start looking at, okay, what motivates humans to do certain things? In most cases, we can find the reasons behind that question. So when we look at terrorists from that lens, we start looking at, okay, why do terrorists do terrorist stuff? And one of the other similarities, the fundamental similarities between organized criminal networks and terrorist networks is this last bullet point about pursuit of power. In the world of organized criminal networks, they're pursuing power so they can control territory, gain profit, all the things you've studied in organized criminal network kind of literature. In the world of terrorism, they're trying to pursue power and gain power to achieve strategic objectives, political objectives. Sometimes those objectives could be um, some form of change, political change, religious change, social change. 
Uh, in other cases, it could be resistance to change, like in the world of the conservative right-wing terrorist groups. Uh, but pursuing power in order to bring about or prevent change is one of the, the streams we see common among most terrorist uh, networks and terrorist groups. Uh, we'll talk about some examples here of that in a moment. <coughs> some of the things that separate terrorist networks from criminal networks are obviously this political dimension. Uh, terrorist groups will typically take credit for their acts of symbolic violence. The horrific things that they do, they'll take credit for it because they're trying to uh, message to multiple audiences, to their recruits, potential recruits, to their own kind, to peer competitors, to the government, to the population at large, and so forth. Organized criminal networks, in contrast, tend not to take credit for those kinds of things. Um, terrorists usually try to inflict some sort of psychological trauma, and the victims that, that are uh, you know, tragically uh, victimized by terrorist attacks are a subset of a much larger group. You take anti-abortion uh, bombings, for example. The victims of an anti-abortion bombing of a clinic or Paul Hill shoots a doctor in Pensacola, Florida or whatnot, those are the victims of the attack. Well, the reason we calculate that as a form of terrorism is because it sends a message to all the other abortion clinics around the country. All the people who might patron, you know, be a patron of an abortion clinic, all the abortion uh, doctors, nurses, and so forth, are terrorized because they're the part of that larger target from which the victims are drawn. And then uh, um, one other uh, aspect of the terrorist groups, of course, is this whole uh, aspect of somewhat randomness in their attacks, uh, again, to inspire fear and to spread a symbolic message to a larger audience. Oftentimes those are innocents, non-combatant kind of individuals who are targeted and victimized by the attacks. Finally, we have a large spectrum of terrorist group ideologies. The things that motivate terrorists and terrorist attacks could be categorized as environmentalist extremists, anti-abortion extremists, right-wing extremists, left-wing extremists. Um, obviously there's a lot of religious extremist terrorism around the country these days. And there's also ethno-nationalist terrorist groups as well that we've studied. So you look at terrorist groups over the last, say, 200, 300 years, you can put most of them in one or more of these categories of ideological motivation. Um, one thing that they do um, most often have in common is the way in which they rely on recruit, support, financial networks, all the kinds of things that sustain their operations. And so even they might be left-wing extremists or they might be religious extremists, they still need people because it's a human endeavor. They need money, weapons, training, they need instructors. They need to have what's called ideological resonance as well. Most terrorist groups die on the vine. Uh, what I mean by that is that a new terrorist group may present itself, may blow up something, and they may be a one-hit wonder because the ideology doesn't resonate with anybody. Nobody in their target population comes to their aid to support them, provide them safe haven, recruits, or whatnot. And so <coughs> the average age of terrorist groups over the last two, three hundred years, it's been about a year and a half. There's actually a very small handful of terrorist groups around the world which have managed to sustain themselves over 10, 15, 20, 30 years. You can actually list those, you know, basically uh, you know, on one piece of paper. You start thinking about ETA in Spain, IRA in Northern Ireland, the FARC in Colombia. Sendero Luminoso in Peru, and on and on. Some of the big terrorist groups from which you can buy books about and you can read their training manuals, all that kind of stuff, they've built up and sustained their operations and their presence over, in some cases, multiple generations. You've got some that didn't manage multiple generations, like the Red Army faction in Germany or the Italian Red Brigades in, in Italy and so forth. They didn't transcend multiple generations. But then the most, the, the overwhelming majority of terrorist groups only last for a very short period of time. So that's actually a good news story when you're studying the entire history of terrorism, why they do what they do, how they would do what they do. And the reason we look at these sorts of things, what terrorist organizations need, is we start, are, are we start identifying the, the uh, ways in which we can exploit those vulnerabilities. If we can make it harder for them to, for example, um, uh, spread their propaganda or gain finances or recruit, radicalize, those kinds of things, we make their jobs even more difficult than they already are. Uh, it's, it's no secret probably to you that being a terrorist sucks. Uh, you're living a clandestine lifestyle, you're looking over your shoulder for the intelligence agencies, law enforcement coming to get you, you're not sure if your new recruit is actually a spy or an informant. There's a lot of trust challenges you're going to have to overcome. There's a lot of, a lot of real problems being 
terrorist, getting involved in a terrorist network. You can't really have a job, so how are you going to pay your rent, buy clothes, buy food, you know, live that kind of lifestyle? So you have to rely on other uh, individuals for that kind of support. A lot of challenges for uh, going into the world of terrorism. And those challenges can be made uh, even worse by law enforcement and counterterrorism. So that's just a general overview of terrorism and terrorists. Then we shift gears and start talking about the weapons that are the focus of this particular lecture, weapons of mass destruction. There's a lot of debate about that term I just used, weapons of mass destruction. Why don't we include incendiary devices in the FBI's uh, definition of WMD? What about high intensity explosives, which now is being included in a lot of definitions, especially in court cases these days. Uh, but in, in the conventional literature on WMD, what you're going to find is these four main categories of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons and or materials. And so if you happen to uh, be inspired to engage in an attack using a ricin pellet, just a little pellet of ricin, which is a very lethal biotoxin, and you target your individual, you kill that individual, you will be prosecuted for using a weapon of mass destruction, even though you didn't do any mass destruction, you killed one person. But because the weapon you used falls into one of these categories, it becomes a WMD. So there's a lot of debate, a lot of uh, uh, sort of contested terrain about the term <coughs> weapon of mass destruction. Uh, but I'm just going to talk about these four categories of weapons and how they differentiate from each other and how there's some similarities. We start off with chemical weapons. This is basically the use of chemicals, chemical materials uh, against a population, an individual, whatnot, for harmful reasons. And these are the easiest and these are the most prolific kinds of WMD around the world. They've been used more than any other kind of WMD throughout history, more by states than uh, terrorists, obviously. I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, all the way back in World War I, you had uh, chemical weapons being used by different militaries. We've seen uh, chemical weapons being used even more recently in Syria, before that in the Iraq-Iran war, and so forth. Chemicals. Uh, could be found all around us. Here at the university, for example, uh, there are probably plenty of different industrial chemicals which, when combined or even when strengthened in terms of their purity, could be uh, weaponized and used in a WMD attack. Not that I'm advocating that, of course. Uh, but that's, you know, that's sort of the reality of the chemical kind of WMD. They're very ubiquitous. Um, where would you find a, uh, a storage facility of chlorine, for example? Any, any ideas? Pool supply store, okay. Uh, where else would you find some hazardous chemicals you might be able to use for your chemical weapon? If you were? What? The chemistry classroom, where else? A farm, okay, sure. Farms would have some pretty uh, high speed chemicals. Okay, so you get the idea. The chemicals are relatively cheap, relatively available to you if you were so motivated to go down that road of a, of a chemical weapon. Biological weapons are a little different. Um, there are some similarities. There are some biological weapons which have the same uh, relative impact of a, a chemical weapon in terms of uh, being geographically contained. Not all biological weapons are the type that you see in Hollywood uh, movies and TV shows where you infect a person, that person then you know, spreads the vector to the whole population and wipes out all these you know, millions of people. Most biological weapons are not contagious, highly infective, uh, the kinds of you know, Hollywood scenarios that you probably think of when you think of biological weapons. The majority of biological weapons actually aren't that. Um, it's actually, uh, for terrorist groups, it's not advantageous for you to have a highly contagious biological weapon that wipes out indiscriminately uh, because you're going to kill your own kind. You're going to kill individuals who might support and fund your organization. You actually, if you have a geographic territory like the ethno-nationalist terrorist groups, you want to carve out a piece of that land, that country, and claim it as your own, like the ethno-nationalist terrorists in uh, Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers, or if you're Eta, the Basque separatists in northern Spain, southern France. There's a geographic territory that you want. The Palestinians, they want a certain geographic territory, the Holy Land. If you wipe out the people or you make that entire land uninhabitable, these things really don't play into those strategic objectives. So you kind of going to eschew those weapons altogether because they don't make sense for your strategic objectives. However, uh, a terrorist might look at anthrax, which is non-contagious. It's not something that's going to spread from person to person. Um, that could be a biological weapon uh, that a terrorist group might find advantageous for them. 
It would elevate the fear factor. It would get them a lot of attention, front page news, all those kinds of things that, that then help might propel their ideology and then move their, their uh, agenda forward. Both chemical weapons and biological weapons can be sprayed, can be put in an HVAC system, can be put uh, in some cases in a paste or a spray can and sprayed on door handles. I mean, there are different dissemination methods, if you will, of chemicals or uh, biological uh, pathogens and so forth. Radiological weapons are somewhat similar to chemical weapons in the same sense that you can geographically control the, um, the impact. You, there's two kinds of radiological weapons. There's a radiological emission device, and the, the more popular one you see in stories and movies, the, the dirty bomb, radiological dispersal device, where you take some radiological material, pack it you know, around a you know, high explosive, some kind of explosive, and detonate it. You can detonate biological, you can detonate chemical agents as well, uh, but many times you're actually going to burn up a lot of the material in the process of doing that. Radiological emission device is something I could bring in a backpack that has a highly radioactive source, place it underneath the seat, and be getting people uh, with radioactive sickness uh, just because it's emitting high levels of radioactivity. Um, not a very uh, useful or helpful uh, um, device, I would imagine, but some terrorists have looked at that as a possibility. The radiological dispersion device uh, would be more difficult because you have to have the radiological source in the right format. Is it liquid? Is it a powder? Is it pellets? Is it marbles? Is it a brick of uranium, uh, which of course is, has a very, very long half-life, doesn't emit a lot of radi radioactivity. I could actually handle, if I had a brick of, radi of uranium in my hand, I could walk around with it, just need to wash my hands afterward. Because the half-life, the amount of radioactivity that it's emitting is very, very low because it has a very long half-life. You compare that to some other radioisotopes that come out of the nuclear fuel cycle that are used in hospitals or laboratories. Do they have radioactive sources here at the, at the university? Uh, in labs, maybe? No? At the hospital or the dentist's office, x-ray offices will have maybe cesium-137 in the x-ray machines. So there are places where you can access different kind of radioisotopes of different levels of radioactivity, which just means, again, that they emit this radiation at different levels. If it's too hot for you, the terrorist, it's not going to be any use to you. If it has a half-life of, say, 36 hours, that doesn't give you time to assemble your weapon and get it to the target. If it has a half-life of a 1,000 years, well, then you can detonate it, but probably doesn't have the kind of radioactivity that's going to get you any impact. Most people from uh, who's going to be victimized or targeted uh, and killed or injured by a dirty bomb will die from the blast itself, not from the radioactivity. So a dirty bomb, you, know, you start examining the impact and the relative bang for the buck, no pun intended, um, from a dirty bomb. It actually makes more sense for you to go, eh, the, the suicide bomb is cheaper. You know, the suicide belt that the Tamil Tigers and Hezbollah and others have developed is cheaper, it's more reliable, we know it works, we can test it before we deploy it. So there's a lot of reasons why the dirty bomb and some of these other things really may not uh, be that appealing. We'll talk about that as well towards the end of this lecture. And then there's a nuclear terrorist, right? All this discussion about um, a terrorist group is going to get a nuclear weapon. I mean, Pakistan, for example, is often, often cited. They're just going to walk over and give a, a, a terrorist uh, like Al Qaeda or the Taliban. Here, have a nuclear weapon. Go to town with it. Maybe Iran develops this nuclear program and starts developing nuclear weapons and then is going to give some nuclear weapons to Hezbollah. Because why not? You know, let's share the wealth. Right? We're going to spend billions of dollars on developing our nuclear weapons arsenal. We can, we can part with a couple of those to a terrorist group that we can't control that may actually blow it up uh, inadvertently on our own soil uh, in the process of trying to deliver it to the target because they don't really know what they're doing. They don't have the right kind of training. But that's the scenario as we hear about and talk about in public discourse and the media and some really good best-selling novels. The reality is, is that nuclear weapons are so difficult that even very wealthy countries have had real difficulties developing nuclear weapons for their militaries, well-resourced militaries even. Nuclear weapons require a lot of uh, training, technology, specialized equipment, oh, and nuclear material, which, by the way, is very highly regulated. 
the fissile material, which gets the uh, atomic explosion. So for a terrorist to get a nuclear weapon would be a real challenge. To detonate it would be another challenge, to get the nuclear material for it. And if you're not going to detonate it right away, something that people don't really know about nuclear weapons, you have to replenish the nuclear material. Because nuclear material is, like I mentioned earlier with radioactive material, it is emitting radioactive uh, emissions, which are going to deplete the, the radioactivity of that and the, the fissile material. And over time, it becomes inert. So that's why we're always replenishing in our own nuclear arsenal here in the US and Russia and China, other countries that have nuclear weapons, they have to replenish the fissile material so that the nuclear weapons, if they should ever need to be used, don't malfunction because you have to replace the fissile material. So there's a lot of challenges for nuclear weapons. They obviously have the most destructive capacity of any of the other categories of WMD. You could, uh, well, with some of the thermonuclear weapons, which are kind of beyond the pale of even most countries, you could destroy uh, a huge, huge geographic space uh, and make it uninhabitable for, for centuries. Those are probably beyond the pale of even the most well-resourced, uh, intelligent, well-financed uh, terrorist group. But there's always a small percentage of possibility. And we'll talk about that as well. These are all kind of high consequence, but very low probability attacks, <coughs> these WMD attacks. Chemical weapons are probably the most easy and the most likely for terrorist groups to be able to go down that road in comparison to biological, radiological, or even nuclear. So from that context, you kind of see, OK, well, we're talking WMD, but really we got to scale back the aspirations of the terrorist group to what's manageable for the terrorist groups. Even those that are highly well financed and, and, and have uh, tons of resources, like Hezbollah, for example, has you know, some estimates of 10,000 members around the world, uh, millions of dollars at their disposal. Uh, even they would have a difficult time in radiological, nuclear, probably bio as well, maybe a little easier for bio, but chemical would definitely be within their, uh, their range of possibilities. So that's what we're talking about in terms of these kinds of weapons. When we put the two together, we put the terrorists, the actors, and the weapons themselves on the same plate and start analyzing them in terms of, okay, under what conditions do we really have to worry about this kind of group using this kind of weapon? We can use this, do you have used this kind of diagram before uh, in analyzing other national security threats, homeland security threats? Have you seen this kind of diagram before? You know, who's the adversary? What's their intentions? What are the capabilities? Very simplistic kind of model. Uh, but this framework, this very simplistic analytical framework, can be applied to the WMD threat analysis as well. What are the intentions of the terrorist groups? And what are they capable of doing? What opportunities do they have to acquire and use successfully a WMD of some sort or another? So when we look at this, does anybody have a terrorist group that would, you, you guess would go in one of these quadrants? ISIS. Okay, where would ISIS go? I, I actually put on the uh, far right because it has a lot of capabilities, but there are really opportunities that are the targeted for people that go to their areas or the people that they have to send people out to capture. Because I don't see them have a whole lot of opportunities to carry out their attacks, but where I was trying to get, because they do have a lot of capabilities. They have a lot of capability. Do they have the capability to acquire and use a WMD? It was one of the questions we want to ask. And then also we want to ask the question of intention. Have they indicated in either intelligence or open source material an, in, an indication that they want to use a WMD of some kind or another? If they, if they have and said, we want to get chemical weapons or we want to get biotechnology expertise into ISIS, right? we put a call out for all these uh, biotech master's degrees students who want to come flock to ISIS, you know, bring your expertise to us, and then we, that would sort of be a huge you know, signal that, okay, they're intending to go down the WD road. So we'd be highly concerned about ISIS, absolutely. But what about IRA, the Irish Republican Army, or some of the splinter groups, PIRA, Provisional IRA, RIRA? Anybody familiar with them? Where would you put them? Uh, as of right now, I would put low, 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 okay. So they're 
Okay, right. And so let's think about them in like say 10 years ago, before the Good Friday Agreement. Would we have put them in the high capabilities but low intention? When you, when you start putting together your list of, of most popular terrorist groups, even least popular terrorist groups, it's actually phenomenal that most of them do fall into the um, high or low key abilities, but most all of them are low intention. There's very, very little intention, uh, at least that, that we can analyze from intelligence sources or from open sources, from Sendero Luminoso, from FARC, ETA, IRA, even Hamas and Hezbollah. They don't come out and say, we want a nuclear weapon. We want to blow up. Uh, you know, Tel Aviv with a nuclear weapon. They don't come out and say that kind of information, and there's no intelligence to suggest they're pursuing that kind of weapon. So there's a low intention, maybe high capability for some of them, like Hezbollah, but there's a low intention. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why we think uh, that is. Um, you have a group like Al Qaeda, in contrast, which has many times declared itself uh, desiring of a nuclear weapon. They want multiple nuclear weapons, uh, preferably some that they can test to make sure they work, and then deploy against the infidels, against the West, and so forth and so on. They have a very strategic uh, set of uh, strategic objectives that they've outlined, reasons why a nuclear weapon are both justified and uh, useful for achieving their overall objectives of establishing a global UMA with Sharia law and those kinds of things, which are familiar with Al-Qaeda. So Al-Qaeda could be put in the high intention, but questionable capability. There was a time where they had higher capabilities than they do today. Uh, there's some intelligence to suggest that uh, their capabilities have not been completely depleted. They're still able to recruit, finance, and, and do, some, do some things. Uh, but there was a time, uh, their heyday was back about maybe 15, uh, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, so capabilities have diminished. The intention is still there. Uh, but of course, they haven't even been able to do much uh, of substance in that realm as well. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you can take your terrorist group, whatever terrorist group you may have I've read about, you know, looked at, studied for a research paper or a class, whatever. You can put them somewhere on this chart. You start looking at their ideology, their strategies, their stated uh, objectives, and so forth, and then their capabilities. So what do we know about the capabilities of a terrorist group? You have to look at their uh, leaders, their members, what kind of uh, expertise do they have within the terrorist organization, uh, what kind of finances do they have, uh, what's the environmental context? If you look at, uh, there's really, I'll talk about uh, later today about the small, uh, relatively small number of terrorist groups which have dabbled in WMD. Probably the most prominent you're familiar, familiar with is the Am Shinrikyo religious cult in Japan. Use the sarin agent, uh, nerve agent, uh, a couple of attacks in Matsumoto and then in the Tokyo subways back in the mid 1990s. They had capabilities. They had a billion dollars in assets. They had their own industrial uh, chemical research facility, which then they could use. This is dual use problem there. They could use that for developing chemical weapons. They dabbled in VX. They, they built uh, uh, some, uh, some sarin uh, agent research programs as well. And they manufactured their own nerve agent. Uh, this is a very rare case. Uh, you don't really find that too much in the world of terrorism uh, throughout history. Uh, so they had, they had uh, biotechnology experts, they had chemists, they had people who had the knowledge, and then they had the resources to pull this thing off. They had um, connections to different networks that they could bring stuff in, and they uh, had local sympathies, and sympathizers would flock into that cult. So a very unique kind of case. But the same set of questions you have to ask, regardless of what terrorist group you're looking at. How well are they financed? What kind of members are they recruiting? What country are they in? What's the environment within that country? Is it an ungoverned space? Is it a uh, weakly governed space? Uh, is it a dem democracy? Are they hiding behind, like in the case of Ram Shamika, are they hiding behind the mantle of a religious organization and therefore somewhat immune to uh, law enforcement investigations uh, because of the, uh, the time that uh, Japan was going through a very uh, sort of religious awakening, a religious opening. So there were a lot of different religious movements all throughout Japan. But Ram Shamika was able to take advantage of that environment. Uh, that's changed a lot now in Japan. But at the time, it was an environment that Option Mikio could basically take advantage of for their operations. And this, ba this bottom bullet here about organizational learning. Learning organizations are those that scan the environment, look at what other terrorist groups are doing, and what's working for them, or in some cases, what's not, work, not working, but incorporating those lessons into their own doctrines and strategies so they can become more sophisticated and you know, presumably more lethal. Those are the terrorist groups we'd be most worried about. There are a few terrorist groups that we know of that have that philosophical commitment, if you will, to organizational learning. Uh, they have 
training manuals, they have doctrines, they have training programs, and they, they bring in as much knowledge as they can, they share that knowledge, and they have a commitment to try and grow the sophistication and knowledge base of their terrorist organization. Most terrorist organizations do not and have not had that kind of commitment, which is one of the reasons why I said earlier, most terrorist groups do not last very long. They don't invest in the kind of internal resources that it would take to grow and sustain and nurture a terrorist movement over a period of, of several years or decades or even generations. A lot of terrorist groups are started by a very small clique of angry young people who just want to do something, change the world, we're going to make an impact. They have a very sort of delusional way of looking at themselves and their place in history. We're going to change the world. No, you're not. You may kill a few people or you know, get front page news for a few days and they'll get arrested, put in jail, and that's pretty much the end of the story. And so you look at the history of terrorism, you find that story repeated along uh, many different avenues, uh, often, more often than not. How would you get access to a chemical, a biological, a radiological, or a nuclear weapon? I mentioned, because weapon type obviously matters when we're talking about the terrorist threat of WMD. I mentioned earlier about chemicals being rather ubiquitous. You might have access to uh, a broad array of chemicals from whether it's chlorine to hydrogen to, you know, just even think of all kinds of different chemicals that you might have access to. So those are, those are the easiest, uh, cheapest uh, way if you're going to get into the WMD world, uh, that would be the way to go, chemical. Nuclear would be the other end of the spectrum. Now, how are you going to get a nuclear weapon or even materials to, to fabricate a nuclear weapon? You can download, if you have the right resources, you can download off the internet all the right manuals and use your resources to put together a gun type nuclear weapon. Or if you're really, really smart and have the right kind of technology at your disposal, you can put together an implosion weapon. But you'll still be missing the fissile material, the uranium-235 or the plutonium-239. Very, very difficult to come by, especially in enough quantities to actually have a fissile explosion. So, you know, you might be able to get some of the, uh, from the AQCon network back in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, you might be able to get some centrifuges, you might be able to get some stuff, vacuum tubes, you know, cool little technology pieces and put this thing together. But without access to nuclear material, you have no nuclear weapon. You can get radiological material from a nuclear power plant, from a, a laboratory, hospital, dentist office, those kinds of things we talked about a moment ago. Uh, but then you've got a radiological device, not a nuclear weapon. So you have to think about how you would go about getting a weapon, or at least materials for a weapon. Chemicals are probably the easiest way to go. Biological uh, pathogens and so forth, those are becoming more ubiquitous. Biotech labs, biotech industry is definitely flourishing. You probably get access to different kinds of pathogens, um, viruses, biotoxins, and so forth. Um, especially in, if your uh, target is not people, but agriculture. Now that's an area that's the threat level in terms of the analysts um, that I've seen. The, the uh, intelligence suggests that terrorist groups might be more amenable to an attack against agriculture because the, the viruses or bacteria or whatever that would attack the agriculture, food supply or, or livestock aren't harmful to humans. So you could actually work with it, you could manipulate it and disseminate it without hurting yourself. So that might be more appealing to the terrorist groups. But in large, uh, in large part, you have to calculate all these different variables and challenges you, the terrorist group, would face to acquire these kinds of things. There's a category, sort of a subcategory of this question about acquiring CBRN, which you know, some analysts don't like to, to talk about it in this framework, this preposition WMD. But many industrial societies have targets, storage facilities with large chemical storage facilities, uh, railways. I'm sure you probably have you know, trains rolling through this area that have big tanker cars. You know, it could be potassium chloride, could be you know, uh, any number, it could be cyanide, it could be any number of chemicals used in, uh, in industries, plastics, textiles, whatever. Uh, so you have these uh, tanker cars going through, and every now and then there's a derailment. Probably had some derailments. There was one here in Texas, so wasn't there just, uh, not too long ago, where uh, some trains uh, caught on fire. Some, some uh, was that Dakota? I forget. Um, 
But, uh, but these derailments happen right now and then. So terrorists might look at that as, well, that's a prepositioned weapon. All I have to do is just blow up the tracks with the, you know, for the right train. Those chemicals come together. It's a binary weapon. Those uh, chemicals come together and make this huge toxic cloud, which is going to wipe out the entire population of Huntsville. So that might be uh, the, the thought process that a, a terrorist might go through. Instead of building the weapon, we're just going to identify a target that can then be uh, used for our purposes. Blowing up a nuclear power plant, that's one of the uh, popular scenarios of Hollywood movies or, or best-selling novels or whatever. Okay, well, that's not really a nuclear explosion, but it can certainly release a lot of radioactivity like we saw in, uh, in recently in Japan and in some other places, like Chernobyl and so forth. Uh, but, you know, by and large, you need a lot of uh, things to go your way, a lot of things to go right for you terrorist group, if you're going to try and access or use that kind of weapon and attack vector. So beyond the possibilities, the capabilities and the opportunities to get a weapon, we also have to look at, okay, why would you want one? Why would you want a kind of WMD for your attack? Especially when there's so many other cheaper ways to go that seem to work, seem to get a lot of attention, the suicide bombers, the, now uh, some of these groups like ISIS and others using kids and women because they're getting attention for that. Um, so what, what do we know about the intentions of terrorists that want to or may want to use a WMD? There's a lot of statements from our government, other governments, some analysts and reports and whatnot, which suggests that it's just a matter of time before we start seeing one or more WMD-related terrorist attacks. There's dozens of identified domestic and international terrorists that want to use WMD, some of the statements. I, don't, I haven't seen the intelligence which led to that, but uh, I have a hard time thinking of more than a dozen groups which have actually broadcast their intention to use a WMD. Um, but you know, we have this um, indication, or these indications, that terrorists intend to, or would like to, use a WMD. Now, based on what I've said so far about the accessibility of certain kinds of chemicals, even radiological isotopes, um, maybe some biological stuff, why haven't we seen this already. There's a high likelihood of WMD by the year 2013, well, a couple of years ago. I guess well, that didn't happen, so I guess, hmm, maybe that was wrong. You start looking at the history of terrorism for some WMD terrorist attacks, and it's actually very difficult. Very, very thin history. Terrorism's been around for nearly 2,000 years. We had terrorist attacks all the way back to the zealot Sakari. Why have we not seen more WMD terrorism in our history? Any suggestions? They're stupid. <laughs> Those terrorists are stupid. They can't figure this out. Well, some of them are smart, some of them not so much. Okay. Yeah. We're very good at stopping them, okay. We constrain the possible uh, avenues by which they could pursue and, and, and acquire and use a WMD. Yeah. Hard to coordinate attacks. It's hard, it's tactically difficult to prepare and deploy these kinds of weapons. All right, so you start thinking of the different reasons why, and there's actually a whole lot of literature about why terrorist groups have not deployed weapons of mass destruction generally throughout the last history. This is 2015. There are so many things that are at your fingertips now, so many capabilities you would have if you wanted to do it. But there's actually a lot of constraints. And the literature on this question of WMD terrorism kind of boils down to, you can put most of these theories into three packaged or three categories, if you will, uh, which I'll talk about here what those, those are. There's the practical constraints, the tactical constraints, like these things are difficult. There's the strategic constraints, like why would we want to do this? How are we going to benefit from this? And then there's the environmental constraints, which is what you're kind of talking about. We make it harder for them to actually do this sort of thing. In terms of practical constraints, one of the most fundamental is that terrorists fear failure. Remember what I said earlier about terrorists, um, you know, terrorism, that kind of lifestyle kind of sucks? Well, if you're going to go into that world, you're going to sacrifice all these things to become a terrorist. We're going to change the world, jihad, you know, right off in the sunset and do this great stuff. You know, you, you're really kind of hoping that it's going to work. You're going to have some possibility of success, maybe multi-generational success. The thing that I do today 
by blowing myself off or whatever I'm going to be doing is going to have a positive impact to bring about the kind of change that I bought into in the first place. If there's no chance of success whatsoever, that's a big disincentive, right? Would any of you want to go play the New England Patriots knowing that you're going to lose? Would you want to go play the Dallas Cowboys knowing you're going to lose? Right? You're not, I'm not going to take the field. I'm not going to bother. I don't know how to do anything that they do. So if you have no chance of success, you're not going to bother. As the complexity of your weapon increases, the chances of failure increase. Easier weapons have a higher likelihood of success. So just by that simple calculation, most terrorist groups are going to look at the, the, you know, the very complex nature of WMD, whether it's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and say, you know, this stuff is complex, it's difficult, I don't really know what I'm doing, and if I did know what I was doing, you know, it's still, I'm not quite sure I can't test it. I'm not quite sure it's going to work the way I want it to work. It may backfire. So I'm just going to go with a thing that I know works because I have a higher likelihood of success. Very just simple, you know, rational, strategic calculation. And again, this takes us away from that sort of mindset of terrorists are these crazy dudes and they're just engaged in mindless killing and blowing stuff up just for the sake of killing stuff. Most terrorists are not psychopaths. The psychological uh, research on terrorism has shown clearly that there's very, very little psychopathology among terrorists. They think rationally, most of them. They want to achieve objectives and they do things to try and achieve those objectives, either collectively or individually. And terrorist groups do not want you if you're a psychopath. Why would the terrorist group like IRA or ETA not want you if you're a psychopath? What do you think? Why do you think they wouldn't want you? What? Bad PR. Bad PR. What else? Unpredictable. You can't control a psychopath. Remember what I said earlier about the operational security vulnerabilities of terrorist groups? It's a clandestine network with a lot of trust. The psychopath is going to go do whatever, because psychopaths are generally very egocentric. So they're going to do things for totally different rationale and reasons that don't necessarily align with the organizations or the ideologies or the terrorist networks, goals and objectives. So a psychopath could be very counterproductive to your terrorist network. So you don't really want psychopaths. You want strategically and objectively oriented individuals to help you in your long-term goals if you're a terrorist network. So terrorist weapons. Uh, the, the terrorists are looking at these weapons, saying, oh, these are very complicated weapons. Um, you know, they might not really be worth a while. Uh, we can't really test them. They're very expensive. They're difficult to acquire. All these practical constraints are looking at going, you know, maybe this really doesn't make much sense. The second category is a strategic constraints category. Why would a WMD help us achieve our objectives in any way better than the things we already have available to us? Conventional weapons are easy to get especially even in industrial societies or in developing countries. How will the WMD help us in any way when we're already, you know, we already have access to the things we need? Oh, and by the way, if we show ourselves to be too brutal, we could actually turn off the population we're trying to recruit. We could pe turn people away from us. The IRA, for example, this is a, some of a lower threshold, but the IRA dabbled in suicide bombings once. And the backlash they got from the uh, community, the Catholic community in Northern Ireland, was such that they never did it again. So terrorist groups have to calibrate the level of violence they deploy if they're going to sustain their movement over a long period of time. If they're going to get finances and recruitment, they have to make sure they don't turn off the population that they need to survive. And so that's part of the strategic calculation as well. You know, do we really want to do this? Is it really going to benefit us, or is it going to be counterproductive? Could provoke a massive government response. If Hamas were to use a chemical weapon in Tel Aviv, for example, I mean, with Netanyahu especially in charge right now, <laughs> gloves would come off and be just game over, right? So they have to calculate that as well. Is this really going to bring about our own demise? There's a lot of, there was a lot of debate on the um, jihadists and Salafist chat rooms and discussion forums after 9-11. Bin Laden, you idiot. You've just brought down you know, hellfire against us, hellfire missiles, uh, against us here in Afghanistan. You took away our safe haven by attacking the US. 
We told you not to do it, you did it anyway. A lot of debate about that being a big strategic mistake on the part of Al Qaeda. Right? A huge government response against them. We are going to lose our momentum by engaging this, by crossing this threshold and really uh, engaging this kind of terrorism. So that could be a strategic calculation as well. And then in some terrorist environments, like in, in the Palestinian territories, for example, there are actually peer competitors. The Al-Aqsa Mardis Brigade is a peer competitor to Hamas and so forth. So you might incentivize them to up the ante. We've seen this peer competition in terms of suicide bombings. Uh, what Mia Bloom calls the outbidding thesis, where one terrorist group in the Palestinian territories will kill five people at a bus stop. And so the al aqsa Martyrs Brigade or PFLP or some others will say, well, we can beat that, and so they'll blow up a bus and kill 12 people. And so the Hamas will respond, we can bid, do better than that, and they'll go in a cafe and kill 15 or 20 people, and on and on and on. So that, that sort of outbidding thesis uh, is part of what uh, they saw in the first and second intifada in, in Israel. And then finally, like you mentioned earlier, governments are working very hard, both at the federal, the state, local, and the international level, to try and constrain access to lethal chemicals, biological pathogens, radio, radioisotopes, radiological materials, and of course, nuclear materials are the number one. That's probably been um, the focus, at least for the last four administrations, uh, presidential administrations, the nuclear has been the big, because it's the, the, it's the worst of the worst of these four categories of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So there's been a lot of attention focused on constraining access to nuclear materials. You can get access to certain kind of technologies and certainly the knowledge on how to build a nuclear weapon, but as long as you can't get the fissile material for a nuclear weapon, you will have no nuclear weapon. So there's been a ton of uh, resources and effort thrown at that particular part of the, of the nuclear terrorism question. Huge strides have been made. Um, if you were going to deploy a nuclear weapon or any kind of uh, weapon of destruction in unfamiliar territory, let's say like the scenario is uh, ISIS is going to send a team into uh, New York, into Dallas, uh, closer to home, um, to detonate some kind of weapon of mass destruction. Well, if these ISIS members have never been to America before and they don't really know Dallas or Dallas traffic, uh, they're, they're going to have a difficult time getting around, getting the target, preparing their operational plan. They're going to stick out. They're going to make mistakes. Uh, so it's a very uh, high risk kind of proposition for them to, to do that kind of attack. Uh, again, it's more complex, high risk, and that, that chart I showed earlier, that's going to lower your chances of success. Your probability of success lowers because of it. So the environment in which uh, you try and uh, calculate this kind of attack also matters. Finally, we start looking at the future. What could change? Because things change all the time. What could change in terms of the environment in which the terrorists operate? What could change in terms of access to weapons or materials? What could change in terms of ideological intentions? What could change in terms of strategic objectives? Um, these kinds of questions we're constantly asking ourselves in terms of looking at five years down the road, 10 years down the road, what might lead a terrorist group that's right now in the low capabilities and or low intention part of our quadrant of our diagram and move them up into high intention and high capability? What things can make it easier for them to either want to deploy or be able to deploy a weapon of mass destruction of some kind? And so when we're analyzing the weapon of mass destruction terrorism threat, these are the kinds of things we need to calculate and put in. It's very complex, again, very complex kind of problem. When we parse it out, to the individuals, the weapons, the kinds of weapons, the kind of environment in which they operate. We start to be able to gather information and intelligence which can lead a much more robust portrait of what we're looking at both now and into the future. So that in mind, just wrap up here. The, the threat of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism is something, it's, it's, it's something that we all have to be concerned about, but we have to put it into the narrow parameters that I've kind of described here the narrow parameters, the constraints that terrorists face, the reasons why uh, most terrorist groups have not even looked at WMD as a possibility with their intention or capability might constrain them. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that should help us sleep a little better at night, uh, although there, I, I, I'm convinced that there very well could be some form of WMD terrorist attack, if not in our country, in a country maybe like Russia, where the Chechens might deploy a WMD, or possibly in uh, Iraq, Syria, where we've seen the, you know, the state of Syria use chemical weapons. Um, so we know that those are 
So there's certain kinds of, uh, of scenarios and environments where we can imagine around the world uh, that we have to account for. All right, so let me finish off there and engage whatever questions and conversation you might like to talk about. Yes. Test. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Forrest, thanks so much uh, for being here on behalf of the college. I think uh, you gave us a really uh, fascinating lecture with a lot uh, to think about conceptually and in terms of policy and so forth. Uh, so thank you for being here first. Um, for the uh, traditional criminologist set amongst the audience, um, I think you said some things that are really striking in terms of concepts. For example, describing how a, a terrorist group and, and thinking about risks and opportunities and so forth at the organizational level and the group's willingness to signal their intent to acquire WMDs and so forth seems to be uh, very prominent in terms of the research on terrorism. And that's an interesting contrast to a criminologist where we often do research at the individual level, thinking about intra-individual rational calculus or situational factors that might predict an outcome like committing an armed robbery, for instance. And so I'm just curious, um, could you think or speak to a little bit how to bridge that gap for those of us criminologists who would be interested in using terrorism and terrorism-related processes as its dependent, dependent variable, how we might go about doing that or encouraging that more? Okay. Well, I think in, in both cases, whether it's the individual criminology level or the terrorist network level, um, it's a choice that's made by humans, right? Individuals or even the leaders of a terrorist network will choose. This is the kind of weapon we want. This is where we're going to deploy it. This is the kind of target we're going to go after, whether it's a robbery of a bank or whether it's a deployment of a chemical weapon or a suicide bombing. So there's a choice that's being made. There are several choices that are being made. So then we start looking at what influences those choices. What environmental factors might influence those choices? What resource factors might influence those choices? What historical factors? You know, has, has there been a, a, a neighboring terrorist group or individual which is engaged in this kind of attack against a bank or a terrorist act that it worked, right? So is there a historical precedent that we can follow? So all these kind of factors would help us analyze what influences that choice. Uh, is there a new policy made by the government? Uh, is it a vulnerable target? All these kind of things would impact the, the choice made by individuals or a network. So that's kind of how we would sort of gather that. So very similar parallels there. Other questions I can have about terrorism in general? Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we, and while you were talking about more homegrown terrorists being generated that would fit in places like that and how, like the, for instance, the snipers in the Washington area, they're just they're paralyzed. They, they weren't terrorists, they were terrorists of a sort, but they're criminals. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in your research and in the groups you're in and your study, uh, what types of strategies are being developed to, 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 uh, to combat, say, the uh, homegrown terrorists that may just terrorize things by going and doing something at a shopping mall or at a school and these kind of things? Uh, that's a great question because by the time they're out there shooting up a shopping mall, it's too late. We're responding to the symptoms and the results of, of, of what they're doing. Um, the research that, that I find most promising is something that you're probably all familiar with, the community policing. There's a lot of uses for community policing, what's called homeland policing. Uh, Jose DeCobo, uh, the deputy sheriff in, in uh, Tampa, Florida, has written a lot about homeland policing and how homeland security and community policing are, are very much a, a dovetailed kind of, uh, of approach, where the intelligence and the relationships gathered uh, through uh, the intelligence gathered through the relationships established through community policing, then feed into a much more robust homeland security, national security effort, which can stop that before it happens. Uh, and so that's why you know, law enforcement plays a, a, a fundamental frontline role, really, when it comes to this homegrown terrorism phenomenon. There are individuals, if you look at the history of uh, homegrown terrorists or lone wolf terrorist attacks over the last, say, 30 years, whether they're school shooters or their uh, individuals like the Sarnia brothers in Boston or, or so forth. Um, you look at the investigation and the materials that come out through the investigation, you start finding they told people, people knew certain things were up, there were certain markers and, and, and indicators uh, that could have been in, uh, put together in an intelligence profile that could have prevented a lot of these things happening. 
Um, but in some cases, there was an environment where the community was not necessarily uh, in a trusted relationship with the local law enforcement or the, the imam, for example, the elder Sarnia brother. Uh, we call him a speed bump. It didn't really have a Tamerlan, Tamerlan uh, Sarnia. But um, uh, he you know, got kicked out of his imam, uh, out of his uh, mosque, because he was too radical. He stood up uh, and, and yelled and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the imam didn't really have a good relationship with the local police uh, at the time. And so that information wasn't uh, shared. Uh, in a timely way. So the community policing could have resolved uh, and uh, that benefited, the relationship could have benefited uh, in that way. So there's a lot of uh, suggestions that community policing can lead to a better way of, of solving or at least addressing the homegrown home uh, terrorism. No, as you know, there's no such thing as 100% security though. There will always be individuals who will find their way to, uh, to the point in which they can shoot up a school, shoot up a mall, blow up a marathon, and so forth. Uh, but the more that uh, collectively, agencies and communities, because if we just rely on law enforcement agencies, as you know, uh, that's an environment that terrorists can man manipulate. Right? If your intelligence is only coming from formal channels, uh, that's an environment that terrorists can definitely benefit from. There has to be the informal channels where local community members, religious leaders, community leaders, and so forth, and even in some cases, parents will come to the local law enforcement saying, look, this is what I'm seeing. Uh, I don't like what I'm seeing. Uh, I think you should do something about it, or at least look into it follow up on it. That's the kind of environment that you know, makes it a lot harder for home home terrorism. Sorry, go ahead, a question. Yes, I was wondering a little bit about uh, the political or the policy implications of what you're suggesting. There's kind of an expectation that policymakers should be in some way making rational expected value calculations with um, risk neutral considerations of risk, but I find that's not really true, um, both in the public and in uh, practitioners, of, of the policeman who's out there saying, not on my watch, or, or the police chief saying, not on my watch, and politicians uh, thinking with a very much of a CYA attitude. Um, to what extent should we be thinking in a less risk neutral way and, and perhaps in a different paradigm of, of Minimax or something like that for these kind of really high consequence but really low likelihood events? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, my thinking in, in, in research into this particular question of the WD terrorist threat goes back about 10 years when you may recall the DHS was uh, really vilified for uh, recommending that people get duct tape and plastic sheeting, right? Uh, there's going to be a WD attack, so get plastic sheeting and duct tape and you know all this kind of nonsense and, and hyperbole and, and uh, hype and, and sort of lunacy in, in my mind. Um, so one of the questions that, that I started to ask is, okay, well, what is the nature of the threat itself? Are we really understanding the nature of the threat uh, and how, maybe how real it is but how constrained it might be at the same time? Uh, and then a response to it. Um, one of the things that I try to emphasize in a much more uh, elaborate written version of this uh, approach is that the vulnerabilities that terrorists face in any form of WMD uh, terrorist plotting uh, could be made much more uh, difficult. You can exacerbate those challenges. Um, you can give them the perception that it's absolutely impossible to get access to these kinds of things. You could um, uh, make uh, it's very, very difficult for them to access the kinds of things they would need for a WMD attack. You can focus in on the things that would make what it is they would need to do to be successful even much more difficult. So once we understand that threat from the terrorist point of view and the constraints that they face, we start to say, well, if we tweak this, if we do this, we talk to the community about these sorts of things and say, you know, if there's an individual who uh, you think might be a little uh, radical, don't employ them at your chemical storage facility. You know, those kinds of simple things really kind of get at the meat, you know, where the rubber hits the road in terms of these kinds of, of, of challenges, as opposed to being much more uh, hyperbolic, very, you know, sort of, uh, we're going to stand up at the pulpit and say, there's a WMD attack of some kind coming, you know, run into your houses and with the duct tape and, and you know, plastic sheet and all that kind of nonsense. So a much more sort of thoughtful approach to the challenge that we face collectively. So that's how I'm hoping that it makes a difference. We have a lot of students here, so I want to invite you to uh, actually ask some questions. Okay, I'm coming over there. 
Uh, thank you for a great lecture. I wanted to ask about, you touched on it a little bit, um, for instance, in the 1990s, the destabilization of the Soviet Union, um, how did that impact this type of threat on the global scale? And if it happened again today, say in India, closer to regions where there is radicalization, um, would that uh, heighten this threat to the more high probability, high risk scenario again? Yeah, that's a great question. So like I mentioned earlier, the, the projection of the future of the WB3 has to account for the environment in which terrorists might be able to acquire certain materials. Uh, will that environment change? Certainly. Uh, could become easier. Hopefully it becomes more difficult. You know, hopefully it shifts in the other direction. But if there is an environment where it becomes more easy to acquire certain kinds of materials and technology, how does that elevate the threat? What groups might, you know, be based on their indicated intention of wanting those kinds of weapons, what, weapon, what groups we need to monitor that closely to make sure they don't take advantage of that new enabling environment. So that's certainly something we would want to look at. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the case of the Soviet Union uh, dissolving, there was a, uh, a retired Russian general, Soviet general, well, I guess Russia at the time, um, who was going to run for election during, I think it was Yeltsin's, uh, Boris Yeltsin's re-election period. And his name was Alexander Levin. And he announced that there had been about 100 suitcase nukes, which are these small tactical nuclear weapons that Russia had built, that Soviets had built, that had gone missing. This is back in the, uh, they were out there. So there was, a lot of there was a lot of concern about these suitcase nukes winding up in the hands of some terrorist group someplace, whether it was you know, Chechens or Al-Qaeda or someplace like that. Um, never, never happened, never materialized, thankfully, maybe a knock on wood. Now it would be too late. Those, the nuclear material in those weapons would need to have been replaced by, uh, by now for them to actually uh, not be inert. So uh, you know, hopefully we have dodged a bullet from that kind of thing. But there was some concern about that. There was a lot more concern about a lot of unguarded chemical uh, warfare facilities, biological warfare facilities, especially when Ken Elibak defected over here to the US. We learned a lot more about the Soviets' um, former biological program. Um, and the Russians were like, well, we can't do anything about it right now because we're broke. I mean, that's kind of how the Soviet Union fell apart. You know, we kind of forced them into bankruptcy. Um, so we spent billions, and I mean like tens of billion dollars. We, America, our taxpayer money, uh, the Sam, uh, the Nun Lugar uh, uh, legislation, the Global Threat Reduction Initiative, uh, all these sorts of initiatives that we're, we've, we've been spending uh, billions of dollars building fences around facilities, trying to hire away um, uh, bio, uh, technical engineers, chemists, uh, nuclear engineers, and so forth, with the right kind of access and knowledge, whatever, which could be uh, very, very um, advantageous to a criminal network or a terrorist network uh, who wants to go down that road. Trying to employ them, give them some reason not to, to be uh, pulled away into that world. Um, we're still spending a lot of money up until December of last year. In December of last year, uh, Putin decided to kick a lot of us uh, helpers out. So I don't know what's happening right now, in fact. There's a lot of concern about our, you know, this becoming an enabling environment because nobody's watching the, the shop. You know, there, is it going to be uh, something that we're going to regret in the future, this uh, fissure in uh, relationships with Russia? Uh, but in answer to the question, it was recognized right away that there's a lot of unguarded materials and weapons and so forth that needed to be protected. And the Russians said, well, we, we don't have the money to do it ourselves. So that's what we've been spending, we in the US, and spending a boatload of money on helping them. And there's all kinds of challenges as well. There's lawyers got involved. You know, lawyers in terms of, well, you know, what happens when a, uh, one of our workers goes over there and you know, hurts himself? The workman's compensation is covered. I mean, there's all kinds of other factors that, that, that had to be ironed out as well from that. Um, Russians, you know, on their part, in some cases there's some facilities that we really had a lot of concern about that they wouldn't let, let us have access to because they were afraid we were going to be spying on them and gathering intelligence and, and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, very tricky negotiations that have to be played out that way. But for, for the sake of global security, um, it, the Russians recognize it's kind of in their best interests as well as ours and the rest of the world is that bad guys or bad people don't get access to those kinds of things. have large nuclear weapons, yeah. can they also have small ones, like the suitcase ones? Or is, there, is the technology a lot different? The technology is different. It's more difficult to do it. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we find out in five, 10 years' time uh, the North Koreans have definitely tried 
that you get. I mean, they've already gone from plutonium now to HEU. They're trying to do uranium-based uh, nuclear weapons as well. So as they continue to spend the money that they could be developing on, on their country and their people who are starting to death uh, on the nuclear program, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually they, uh, they I wouldn't be surprised if China also has nuclear, actually nuclear weapons. And of course, if China gets it, North Korea will get the technology. Oh, I just wanted to ask them, if it's feasible for a state to sponsor terrorism, as in they fund terrorist groups with weapons and arms, it's entirely feasible for them to, to give them WMDs. So is there really a way to combat sponsored, state-sponsored terrorism um, worldwide instead of just domestically? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's been a whole slew of sanctions on states like Iran and Libya and others that have been uh, accused of being a state sponsor of terrorism. Cuba right now is lobbying to be taken off the list of state sponsors of terrorism uh, because you know, it's kind of hard to find any evidence of them sponsoring a, a terrorist group in the last 30 years. Uh, but they've remained on the uh, list for, for political reasons. Um, yeah, so there's, there's several kinds of state sponsorship as well. There's state sponsorship which is overt, like we're gonna give you, like in the case of Libya, for example, Muammar Gaddafi actually provided weapons and military training to different terrorist groups in different training camps. Uh, he had, you know, there were colonels in the Libyan military who were training terrorists in Libya during the late 1980s and so forth. So, you know, there's that overt kind of state sponsorship. Money, Soviet Union would provide some, uh, some ideological and some kind of financial support to some left-wing communist terrorist groups as well. Um, you know, so that's been part of the history. Then there's the sort of not overt, more of a passive support of terrorism. And that's what we're concerned about in terms of countries that, <clears throat> may not control the entire geographic space on the map. And so it's an enabling environment for other terrorist groups uh, to train, to equip, to recruit, uh, those kinds of things, have a safe haven. So that passive support of terrorism is a little trickier to impose sanctions against a state because the state says, look, we can't, we can't control what's going on on our borders. You gotta help us with resources. You gotta train our military, but then the level of corruption is so high that the resources don't go to where you're intending them to go, and it becomes just sort of a sort of vicious cycle. We've seen that in several African countries as well. We, you know, we go in with the good intentions to help a country um, secure its borders, get rid of these ungoverned spaces, and make it a lot less hospitable to terrorist groups uh, so that we can get rid of that passive state sponsorship problem. And in, in turn, we end up uh, seeing the money go and filter off to the elites and get spent on Rolls Royces and bank accounts instead of the things that we intended it to do. So it's, it's a very complicated challenge, the state sponsorship. So just to uh, take off of what he was saying, uh, I was wondering, is it possible to, for certain countries like North Korea to not only uh, sponsor, but for, if you will, contract certain certain uh, terrorist groups to carry out their their ideas? Like say, thankfully this didn't happen, but with all this stuff that was going on about, uh, about the interview with how North Korea is upset, do, is it possible that there are some countries like that that would say, I have an idea. Hey, I kind of you guys don't like the U.S. either. How about we contract you guys and uh, you go there and uh, handle a few things for us? <laughs> like, do you think it's possible that there are some countries that would do that? I'm sure there's some countries that have considered it, um, and there are some countries that have their own indigenous groups, uh, sort of uh, non-official groups and groups that do engage in terrorist activity, like Iran, that uh, have done terrorist activity on behalf of the state. They've been directed and told what to do. Uh, in some cases, Libya, I mean not Libya, uh, Hezbollah has been implicated in um, attacks that Iran wanted them to, to be a part of. Um, North Korea as a country was, was um, at one point in time linked to the Japanese Red Army, uh, which was linked up with the PFLP, and so there were several different attacks that they are uh, indirectly, I guess you could say, linked to uh, in terms of sponsorship. Um, but then you have to look at the terrorist groups themselves. Like, in, in terms of Al-Qaeda, right? Yes, Al-Qaeda may share an enemy with North Korea. But what Al-Qaeda's target population, its recruit sources, its fund sources, would all those things uh, be jeopardized 
by being seen to be in the back pocket of a crazy dictator like in North Korea. You know, so they'd have to sort of calculate that strategically. Is this really going to be in our best interest? So it's not necessary that the state would have the calling card in that relationship. And then, of course, if the terrorist group went off and did something that was counterproductive to the state, the state has no way of, you know, of saying, OK, we're going to cancel our contract. Because by then, the Pandora's box has been opened. And the Hellfire missiles are going to be raining down on them. So it's a very, very tricky thing to, to consider if you're the state or the terrorist group. There's a lot of reasons why you may not want to do that. It has happened. I just want to say thank you for a great lecture. It was, it was really uh, informational. Um, you know, you said that a lot of, in, throughout history, a lot of terrorist organizations kind of start up and fizzle out real quick. They don't really change a whole lot. Um, but, you know, after watching the news and things that surface on the Islamic State and how um, their goal is to incite holy war and, you know, the, the butchering of children and the, the sale of children and things is, is uh, kind of a goal to get other religions to hate Islam and to incite the holy war between, you know, all the different things. Do you think that that they would be successful in that or do you think that they will be another kind of five minutes of fame, you know, on front pages and then they'll fizzle out or do you think that they'll be uh, somewhat successful in, in inciting kind of a, a holy war between the different religions? ISIS will fail. ISIS is already doing the things that's bringing about its own failure. Killing a Jordanian pilot, for example, we already see what Jordan, how Jordan is responding to that. That has a knock-on effect, a second and third order effect, a lot of other Arab countries from which individuals may have been recruited into ISIS. Those countries are now going to make it a lot harder for individuals who may have you know, answered the call of ISIS, will make it a lot harder for them to actually transfer into ISIS, into that territory. So no, you're not going. We're, we're standing down. We're not going to allow it. And so as, as things progress, I think over the next several years, we're going to see uh, ISIS um, have a much more difficult challenge <clears throat> recruiting, funding, um, getting any sort of legitimacy, any attraction at all. They're shooting themselves in the foot. And this is something that a lot of terrorist groups uh, find um, very counterproductive, uh, being too brutal. If you look at the reasons why a lot of terrorist groups end, some of them go the political route. They join the political process, like the IRA, the ETA, FARC. Uh, others uh, become too brutal for their own good. Others, uh, they, they split and fracture because of disagreements within uh, the organization. We've seen that within Al-Shabaab. We're seeing that in Boko Haram. We're seeing that in ISIS, too. Also, where those individuals within ISIS are saying, hey, hold, hold on here. Is this really what I signed up to do? I didn't sign up to be killing other Muslims. You know, I, if we're going to incite a holy war, then let's go after the infidels. Why are we killing our Muslim our brethren and children and women? So there's a lot of disagreements now that we're seeing. And those disagreements are being played out on open discussion forums, Twitter. You can, you can see, you can monitor these things in open uh, internet. That's one of the good things about the internet that's enabled us to, to really understand a lot of sort of debates, strategic, tactical, and operational debates going on among these groups, these networks, uh, whether it's ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab, is that there's individuals who do not agree with what's being done. And that disagreement, those disagreements boil up into huge heated debates. And some individuals who may be recruited by the call of ISIS now are looking at this going, well, you know, this disagreement, this guy, actually, he makes more sense than this leader of ISIS. And so those things are actually going to lead to uh, the, the end state, I think, for ISIS. Much more so than anything that Barack Obama or any American or any Western leader has to say or do. So ISIS will fail. Yes, Keith. Uh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> you mentioned how relatively easy it would be for a, a properly funded organization or individual to build a device that could employ a nuclear uh, explosion, um, uh, yeah. su such as like having online manuals or things like oh, of that yeah. nature. Uh, has there ever been a study uh, by an organization or the United States to actually find out how possible it would be? to uh, find and obtain uh, nuclear level uh, materials, like uh, such as funding an organization, individual, or finding an informant to purchase uh, uh, materials to make a nuclear device? Oh, sure, sure. There's a lot of red teaming that goes on. 
There's, a, there's the IAEA tracks a lot of uh, trafficking of any kind of radioactive source material. Um, for a nuclear weapon, you need, there's only two things. You need uranium-235 that's been enriched above 20%, which is a very small quantity of that available in the world. Or you need plutonium-239, which is what happened when you, we have uranium-239 in the case of plutonium-239. So without those two, one of those two things, you can't have a nuclear weapon. So the idea, sort of the scenario, you're going to go into a nuclear power plant and get some of that uranium that's used in the nuclear power plant. Well, that stuff's only enriched to 3% 3, 3 to 5%. You can't have a nuclear weapon with that. So yeah, there's a lot of nuclear material, quote unquote, but if it's not enriched to the right amount and if it's not in the right substance that you can then mold and use in a nuclear weapon, all these kind of things make it much more difficult for you. So yeah, there are a lot of studies on this, this question. So then what becomes most important is knowing where all the uranium is 20% or higher, where it is. Who's got it? How well is it secured? How well has Pakistan secured its nuclear material? How well has Iran secured its nuclear material? That's why the IAE is, is so important. The International Atomic Energy Agency is so crudal, crucial in this sort of nuclear security question because they're the ones that they're charged with by the international community of monitoring that material. And so as long as they know where everything is, who's guarding it, how well it's guarded, and there's red teaming exercises where they can, the country can put together a, a team of, uh, of experts who are going to try and attack the facility and you know, test out their security measures and give them some report about, okay, well, this is what you need to do to make it more, you know, strengthen your security. So we do that here in the U.S. as well. The um, National Nuclear Security Agency does these red teams exercises. Um, you may have read about them, like Newsweek and Time has, has, has written reports about them as well. Or you know, it's a fascinating job if you want a, a job in that world too. You could sign up and get training and be part of those red teams and attack a nuclear facility if you want to see what happens. You know, test their security measures. But yeah, there's a lot of lot of work being done on that. So. Yes, Kim. As a state, what do you feel is the best way um, to reduce public support for terrorist organization among the indigenous population? Could you say which? As a state, uh, what do you feel is the best way to reduce uh, the public support among the indigenous population? Like in Afghanistan, how would you um, get uh, Afghanis to support the mission of getting rid of terrorist groups? Yeah, that's great. A great question. Because I mean, the immediate response is, okay, which terrorist group are you talking about? What kind of terrorist ideology do they have? Uh, how legitimate? How much traction do they have among the population? And what alternatives do they have? Is if the alternative is a corrupt, brutal uh, government, like in Syria, for example, the terrorist group's ideology may actually have more resonance because they're seen as a more viable, useful, uh, potentially um, legitimate and valuable alternative to this oppressive, brutal, uh, corrupt regime that you know, you're living under. And so in that environment, it, it's very, very difficult to try and dissuade the public or a small percentage of the public that may be going through the terrorist group from going that direction. But if you give them a viable alternative, a legitimate, maybe democratically elected government, if possible, um, that's providing resources to the people, hospitals. I mean, you look at southern Lebanon, for example. One of the reasons Lebanon has such difficulty combating Hezbollah is because in southern Lebanon, for decades, they just kind of left it alone. They didn't put much resources and investment into that, that part of Lebanon. And so the hospitals were built by Hezbollah. The schools were built by Hezbollah. The roads were built by Hezbollah. And so Hezbollah has a lot of street credit. They have a lot of credibility and legitimacy among the population of southern Lebanon. And that, in turn, enables them to do what they want with a lot of impunity. Now, Lebanon has a real challenge to try and convince that population that, no, no, Hezbollah is bad, Hezbollah is wrong, when Lebanon hasn't earned that legitimacy, the Lebanese government. And so that's part of the challenge that Lebanon faces. So it's very contextual. I mean, terrorism is a very contextual phenomenon. And so addressing it, it requires a lot of attention to the different contexts. In Afghanistan, you know, right now, we're trying to, we've been spending a lot of time and money and resources trying to bolster a credible and a legitimate government in Afghanistan, which is something that is still kind of foreign to most Afghanis. They've never had that before. They've never had the kind of government that we envision them having. Um, the the long-term sort of utopian vision is that eventually there'll be an established, credible, functioning government providing resources and services uh, without any corruption to all the people of Afghanistan, and it makes it a lot more difficult for the residents of that Taliban or other insurgency groups in Afghanistan from drawing the population towards them because they have a much more viable alternative. But that's a long-term challenge. It takes a long, long time to build. 
questions as you may have. Are we almost out of time? Or? I think we are just about out of time. So okay. thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Bates Room for grad students if you want to continue the conversation. Cool. All right. Thank you all for attending. Appreciate it.